Hi, I'm Matt Steiner. Matt is a senior crime scene analyst. He explained how crime scenes worked in Technique Critique. So in this case, um, he uses deductive reasoning to come up with the handedness of our victim. Hey, I'm Louise Matsakis. Louise is a staff writer at Wired. Matt is going to teach Louise how to lift fingerprints from different surfaces, ranging from easy ones to difficult ones. So I put my fingerprints on a bunch of stuff. Where should we start? Let's start with something easy. So what do you see here? What should we be thinking about when we're looking at this plexiglass? The first thing we want to consider is the surface itself. The most ideal surface for fingerprints is something that's smooth and non-porous. And that's what we got here. We have plexiglass. It's great for fingerprints. So now we prepare our fingerprint powder and our brushes we're going to use. What we're going to do is we're going to coat the brush with powder. So what's the powder made out of? For white powder, it's titanium dioxide with some sort of wetting agents. For this, after we apply powder to it, we want to spin off the excess powder. Is that good, do you think? Yeah, it's good. It's always better to add powder than it is to remove powder. So we want to add powder slowly to our surface. While we're dusting, we want to look at the surface and we want to use our oblique lighting also. So that's going to help us direct where we're going to brush. We're just going to move it back and forth on the surface. And then once I see a fingerprint develop, I want to then look at the way the ridge detail is going and follow that pattern. All right, I don't think I have enough powder. Either that or you're a lot better at this than I have. Oh, I see some. Okay, oh, I good? see some. I'm seeing that way. But do you see if it's, is it a whirl? Is it a loop? Is it an arch? Which way uh, is, are the lines going? Is it going in a circle? Yeah, it looks kind of circle-y. Okay, maybe. so now take your brush and follow that circle. And that's to develop the print a little more. Oh yeah, it's coming out great. So we're done with dusting. Let's go on to lifting. Fingerprint. It's like packing tape. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's specifically designed for fingerprints. Oh, so it's uh, like super, like, like very particularly sticky? You'll notice it's very clear. So it's very we, clear, okay. If we open it up, we should be able to see right through it. So we want to do it in one steady, swift motion, like so. Excellent. So what I want to do first is, is I'm going to start my tape outside of where that print is. So I'll start it over here. The next thing I want to do is create an anchor point. I do that by moving my finger up and down. And then what I want to do is smooth my finger across the fingerprint. If there's any sort of texture there, I want to work my finger in. When I'm done, we have a fingerprint. I actually got it, guys. So the next step now is to take this lift and put it onto an acetate. OK, what's an acetate? It's just a piece of plastic that we're going to put it onto. Got it. OK, let's make a transfer. What we want to do is put our acetate on a clean surface. But my fingerprint is right there. So I want to make sure that that gets on the card. So the same way that I lifted it, I want to put it down. And then once it's there, I'm going to rub back and forth to make sure I get out any sort of air bubbles that may be there. Oh yeah, there's a big one in here. <laughs> and there we go. My print is now on the acetate. Now that you mastered tape lifting, uh, let's move on to something more difficult. Okay, I'm ready. So the most ideal surface, like I said, is something that's smooth and non-porous. But if we have a surface that isn't smooth, that has a texture to it, or is curved, it's more difficult. In these situations, we'd want to use a product called Microsil or any sort of casting type of silicone component. Okay, so the next step now is to process these surfaces. In this case, we have a light colored surface, so we'll use a black powder. It's a carbon agent and a uh, wetting agent also. So we have our powder and we have two brushes. Okay, we we'll take a look at it with the light and we see that there's a really nice fingerprint right there. So lightly apply some powder to it. So just, just to barely, <laughs> yeah. Sorry, I powdered my nose. That's gonna happen. And now if you see a pattern there, follow that arch. What do you think? I think we're good. Okay, great. Should we get some more powder for the golf ball? Yes. Try just to move just the tips of the brush and move it back and forth. See anything appearing? Mm. Any friction ridge detail? Not too much. Okay. This is a really hard surface, huh? It is a hard surface. Is there any like object shape like that that you usually see besides like doorknobs? Not this difficult, but I've had uh, occasion to have textured surfaces that are dimpled like this. Like what kind of objects? Uh, I've had a vase at a crime scene that had mm -hmm. a very textured surface like that. And that if I was to try to lift it with regular lifting tape, it wouldn't have done anything. So the next step now is to prepare our microsil and apply it to our surface. So this is microsil. It's a casting component we use to recover fingerprints or impressions from difficult surfaces. So I'll do one from one side of the card to the other. And now I'm gonna draw a line just below it in the hardener. And you'll see it's gonna come out thinner. But as long as it's the same length, 
That's all that matters to me. Mix the blue into the white, and I'm just gonna scoop up some of this microsil, and we're just gonna spread it over, just like you would spackle a hole. All right. What kind of cases have you used this in before? Everything from sexual assaults to homicides. I had a case where someone broke into a house and they left a tool mark impression from a mm. screwdriver to break in. So we used that to cast the tool mark impression. So now I'm gonna have you mix up your own batch. So you can use this not only for fingerprints, but you could use it for other sorts of impressions as well. Yes. So how long does it take to dry? Well, it depends on the environment, but within 15, 20 minutes, it should be dry. So let's take a look at what we got. The big reveal. Whoa. Look at that. So would I now put this print on tape like usual, or would I take a photograph of this? Where would I go next with my little print on here? So after we're done recovering this, we want to secure it so that fingerprint doesn't get destroyed. So we'll put it into a small box. We'll send this to the lab. They'll take examination quality photographs of it, and they may have to do other types of en enhancement to it. But these look great. Like, I think you can make an identification just from these guys. That's really impressive. Totally worked. You didn't think it was gonna work? No, I mean, I thought it was gonna work, but it's like, it's just so clear. Yes, like... no, it's really good. So you ready for a more difficult situation? Let's do it. This bottle is curved, which is difficult to begin with. Let's make it even more difficult. Let's say it rained the night before. Okay. So fingerprints are comprised mostly of water. The remaining percentage of fingerprints are minerals, salts, amino acids, and lipids. So if it rained, that 98% of the fingerprint is gone. But what remains could be the fatty part of the fingerprint. Got it, it's so like the oils that were on my finger. Right, so sebaceous glands that you have are secreting oils, and there's products which will react with those lipids. And make them stand out? Yeah, so it's a suspended solution of molybdenum disulfide that will react with the fats in your fingerprint. So is there uh, any technique here that I should be aware of? So start at the top and work your way across and down. Okay. And we'll completely coat this in it. And you can actually Whoa. see where it's beating off. You can see that reaction between the two. Yeah, I can see a fingerprint right there, totally. Okay. So what we're seeing is, just like water would beat off of oil, this product is beating off the areas that we have fingerprints. We're looking for that reaction. And when we want to stop that reaction, we want to clean it with some water. So just spray, spray, spray. Okay. Wow, that's crazy. It just stays right on there. How often do you use this technique? So it's good for surfaces that are wet. It also works really well on greasy surfaces. Mm -hmm. So if I had a crime scene in a kitchen and there's a layer of grease on everything, if you try to dust it, you're just gonna spread that grease around. So what I want you to do is the same technique we used before to lift it, you're gonna do the same thing. Just notice that it's gonna be a little more difficult. Ah, That's right. Okay, I think I see it on there, or a little bit maybe? A little bit. Okay. I think you could have done better. Okay, well. And again, let's just clean that off a bit. Are there situations where you have to hurry at a crime scene? Yeah, I mean, if this is outside and it's continually raining and there's no way that we could shield that, we may have to lift it right away. Like off a car or something that was outside. Right. So then we would take this print and we'd transfer it to a card. Would you like draw a picture of the bottle? Yeah, absolutely. We draw a diagram of the bottle and like circle or draw an arrow to where we got the print from. So now we'll make it harder on ourselves. What if we have a bloody fingerprint? So we have three different types of impressions at a crime scene. We have latent, patent, and plastic. Latent is what we already have developed with the fingerprint powder. Patent is where it's impressed in some sort of substance, so blood, mud, oil. A plastic print is impressed in a soft surface. So we're gonna create some bloody fingerprints on our drywall, and we're gonna use a chemical to process it to enhance the detail that could be there. So where are we gonna get the blood? I actually brought some for us. No people were harmed in the... <laughs> no, no one was harmed. This was taken with someone's permission. It's actually been treated, so it's very safe. We could actually drink that if we wanted to. It's very cold. <laughs> I just imagined blood to be warm, I guess. Okay, so keep going across. Keep going. Let's do another one, do a little bit below that. Let's do another one. Let's do one more. On this scale, what do you usually see? Is it like really bloody like that, or do you usually see yeah, more you can, like Yeah, you this can sort of see thing? anywhere in between. So you would think like the bloodier ones are your better ones, but it's usually the lighter ones that are gonna give us more detail. So actually, if we just look at them now, we may see some rich detail, we may not. Actually, women have more minutia. They'll have 
tighter ridge detail than men. So sometimes it's more difficult to see women's fingerprints. What about age? Is it easier to see like an older person's print versus, I'm assuming like a baby would be yeah. really hard versus like someone who's middle aged? Yeah, absolutely, that's true. But your fingerprints don't change throughout your life. If you're a teller or if you work in masonry, sometimes you can wear down your fingerprints. All right, so I'm gonna do the same thing. How often do you see bloody fingerprints? Unfortunately, a lot. Really? So this is not just a movie thing, it's something you see quite no, often? No, yeah. But it is like the best type of evidence that we can get. So if we have the victim's blood and we have the suspect's impression in that victim's blood, it's like a smoking gun type of evidence. It's pretty incriminating, huh? Yes. All right, so now we're gonna apply leucocrystal violet to our surface. So what does the chemical do? A lot of presumptive blood agents will have hydrogen peroxide in it, and so there's a mixture of leucocrystal violet with hydrogen peroxide. That catalytic reaction that we have, that hydrogen peroxide will have with the heme group in blood, it will turn this product uh, purple to violet. For this, we're gonna put on masks also because we don't, really don't wanna breathe this in. So what's the reason for the mask? Well, put it this way, this chemical is gonna turn blood into violet purple color. We don't wanna turn our insides that color. Got it, yeah, I'm not, that's definitely not what I want. It's not carcinogenic, but we still don't wanna breathe it in. So we'll cover these areas with filter paper and then we're just gonna spray the chemical right on top of it. You can see that color change immediately. Wow, it's so bright already. If we don't see any areas that are still red through the filter paper, we can lift this up oh and God, see wow. how it developed. It's so much more clear. So if you could see, before we didn't see a lot of detail in some of these, it started to bring out detail. And so even on some of these lighter ones, it, it developed it pretty good. So do you use UV light to examine these or do you just do it under like normal light or use a flashlight or something like that? Yeah, certain chemicals we use uh, require different wavelengths of light. Not so much with this, but with fluorescent powders, certain chemicals like fluorescein will use a specific wavelength of light. So would the next step be to take a photo or would you bring the tape out again? So we would first photograph it as is. So we would take a close up macro shot of these fingerprints before we process them and then we would photograph them again. And then what we could do is just cut the surface out and send it to the lab because there's other steps that they could do at the lab that we can't do in the field. So after you collect the fingerprints, how are they analyzed? What sorts of databases are you checking them against? When we're done recovering the fingerprints, uh, we create a report for that and then we send the report with our fingerprints to an analyst. The analyst will first look at the fingerprints to first say they're of value or they're not of value if there's enough points of identification in there for them to make it, uh, an ID on it. Once they say that it's of value, then they'll scan it into the database. So there is the local database, and then there's a state level, and then there's a federal database. So that's how you look fingerprints. Thank you so much for showing me.